Jati Viduka. Birth is suffering. I heard someone recently explaining the Buddha's list of the different forms of suffering. He came to this one and said, well, it's behind us now. And the problem is it's not behind us. We have it behind us, but we also have it ahead of us if we're not careful. Each time it happens, it's like a throw of the dice. As I say, you're, the opportunities that are open to you are based on your past karma. But look at your karma. You don't even have to look at past lifetimes or no past lifetimes. Look at your karma in this lifetime. You realize you've got a mixed bag. You've done skillful things, unskillful things. And only a very well-trained mind can be sure to focus on the skillful things at the moment of death and rebirth. Because it's what you focus on. That's what creates the state of becoming. There'll be a desire of one form or another. And around the focal point of that desire, it will form either a world, the world in which that object exists, or an identity. Sometimes your, de your desire is not so much about what you want to get out of the world, but what you would like to be. This is how becoming begins. And you go in for it. That's birth. And you notice how, when you fall asleep, how random the process is. We talk about our dreams. Sometimes with a sense of disbelief. How could that have happened? How could that dream have occurred to you? Well, the same thing happens with rebirth. Sometimes it's very unlikely, and yet it happens. So this is why we have to train our minds, so that we'll have some control over where they go. The Buddha talks about having a self rightly directed. You're fortunate in this lifetime you've got some past merit you can depend on. But that's not going to be enough. You have to make sure you, you focus yourself in the right direction. And basically the right direction is out. As the Buddha said, the people hang around and try to develop the world are not following his teachings. It's the ones who want to get out, realizing that this is best, the best course for everybody. Because even if you're here to be a, a good person, you're a burden on so many other beings. That's one of the reasons why we have that reflection on the requisites so often. The simple fact that you get a body means that you're going to need food and clothing and shelter and medicine. And there are a lot of supply lines involved in all of those things. You come into the world with lots of needs, and you're going to have to lay claim to things. And the problem is other people are going to be laying claim as well, and then we get into battles over it. We do a lot of unskillful things in those battles. And that's something we have to watch out for, realizing that somebody really misbehaved, behaved in a cruel or unfair fashion. And then you get fixated on that, and that becomes a focal point for another becoming. And it goes on and on and on. So you've got to learn how to think in ways that get you out. For instance, the Buddha says when someone misbehaves, our ordinary reaction is anger. But he says the proper reaction is compassion. You should want for that person or that being to have some happiness and then look at what they're doing. They're doing all kinds of unskillful things that are going to lead them down. And it's when you can pull out enough to have compassion. That's when you're on the right track. But 
The Buddhist teachings are all about pulling out of conflicts. Back in those days, in addition to the wars they had, I mean actual wars, there were huge debates. India at the time was a hotbed of all kinds of opinions, and people would debate and debate and debate their opinions. It became such a central part of the society that kings and queens would set up assembly halls for debates. It was part of the entertainment, but there was a very strong sense of identity that was built around it. And again and again, when the Buddha is talking about the different positions people would take on whether after death there was survival, the self survived, or the self didn't survive after death, or whether the world was eternal, the world was not eternal, finite or infinite, a long list of different opposing views. The Buddha would often focus not so much on the content of the views. He'd, look, he'd say, well, look at this. You're fabricating this view, and then you're clinging to it, and then you're suffering as a result. In other words, he stepped back and looked at the process of suffering involved in taking sides. And then seeing all the unskillful things that people do based on that. For what? Something that falls apart. And then you're left with the karma. So we look at views as processes. And the question is, is this a process that leads away, or does it just lead to more suffering? That's the nature of his insight. And so you look at the conflicts that you get involved in. And ask yourself, to what extent is something actually being accomplished, and to what extent is it just creating more and more things to tie you down? Well, look at the process by which you created the opinion that led to the conflict. And the fact that your opinion may, may be right, that's those are the most seductive and the hardest ones to pull yourself away from. And yet you've got to pull yourself away. As long as there's an opinion that's going to tie you down, you've got to get out of it. Now, there are some views that help, help you get out. Those are, those are the places where you take, take positions. The Buddha was critical of people who wouldn't take a position on anything at all, but particularly of the issue of what was skillful and was not, what was not skillful. That, he said, is an issue that you have to take a position on, because people are constantly acting. They're acting in ways that can either lead to suffering or lead away from suffering. But again, you make that distinction and you hold that view not for the purpose of arguing, but for the purpose of liberating yourself. The same with the Four Noble Truths, analyzing where they're suffering and what's causing it. This is the type of analysis that you apply to all your views. Where is the suffering in the clinging to the view? What's causing it? What craving lies behind the view? Can you learn to wean yourself off of that craving? And you do that by developing the path. And the path starts with right view. We don't real, realize often how radical right view is. It's a way of looking at the construction of views, looking at the way of construction, construction of positions. the construction of identities, the construction of worlds. It's getting a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on. And then from there, you develop your attitudes. And one of them is the resolve on renunciation, realizing that the desire for sensual pleasures it's just going to lead to more and more struggle. It would be good to find a way to find happiness that doesn't rely on sensuality. The resolve on non ill will, in other words, resolve on goodwill or equanimity, as the case may be, may be appropriate. 
and trying to have goodwill for all, even people who are really difficult. The purpose of this is to pull you out of the different sides of conflicts. in a way that's not escapist, in a way that actually is good for the people involved in the conflict. If you can help get them out too, then you're happy to do it. And then finally resolve on harmlessness, which the Buddha basically says is equivalent to compassion. Seeing the suffering that people are creating for themselves and wondering to know not so much, well, who did right and who did wrong, but the question is, how can we stop the suffering? How can we get people to stop creating these things that they latch on to and then create more and more suffering and more and more unskillful behavior for, them, for themselves? Well, the first question, of course, is how are we going to learn how to stop? You have to look inside. Because only when you look inside and see these behind-the-scene processes in your own mind can you understand how they operate in other people. And also how you can see the skillful way out. So this is why we meditate, is to watch the processes of the mind, to see how things form. We do that by trying to form a state of concentration. We get hands-on experience with bodily fabrication, the breath verbal fabrication, the way we talk to ourselves, and the mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions, seeing how we put these things together to create a state of concentration. And then as the concentration deepens, some of them will peel off. That's how you see that they are distinct. The first one that peels off is the directed thought and evaluation. The second one that peels off is going to be the breath, in and out breath. You will have breath energy in the body, but the in and out breath will grow calm. And only at the very high levels of the formless jhanas can you see the mental fabrication peel away. So you're getting hands on experience of saying, this is how we put states of mind together. And then you can turn around and look at how you do it in other issues around your life. How you put greed together, how you put anger together, how you put grief together. It's the same processes. So we're looking at the process of construction to learn how to pull ourselves out of our constructs. And that's how we can pull ourselves out of this problem of birth. As the Buddha says, you put these things together and you create a state of becoming. He gives all the steps. It sounds abstract when you see them all laid out, but he, he, it's a very detailed account of what's actually going on all the time in your mind. As you formulate a desire, and then an identity builds around that and a world in which the object of the desire also appears. And then you go into it, and there's another birth. We're taking birth all the time. Simply that the birth that happens when you leave the body and go latch on to another one, that's a really major one. And as I said, for most people it's like throwing the dice. The Buddha's image is of throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. given the mixed bag of most people's karma. With birth, all bets are off. Because after all, even though you may have created a lot of good karma in this lifetime, you don't know about your past lifetimes, what might come surging to the forefront at that moment. But you do have choices. Even at the moment of death, there are choices. Some people think that well, once death happens, that's it, there's nothing you can do. But that's when you're actually going to be making your most important choices. So you want to have your wits about you, so you can make your choices wisely, as long as there's going to be 
birth, okay, make sure that, that you suffer as little out of it, and you go to a place where there's a minimum amount of suffering and a maximum opportunity to practice. So ultimately you can find the escape. In the meantime, in the dealings with your dealings with the world, you want to make sure that you work on resolve and renunciation. In other words, looking for happiness in the concentration, so that you're less fixated on the happiness and the pleasures of the world outside. Resolve on non-ill will, i.e. goodwill. Resolve on harmlessness, i.e. compassion. Those are the attitudes we should have toward the rest of the world. And so when we find our minds going off in other directions, we have to stop and take stock. Are these other directions, are they going to just entangle us even deeper and deeper in the traps of the world? Or are we going to be able to free ourselves? Because we're the ones who trap ourselves. That's something we've got to keep in mind. Through our choices, we've trapped ourselves many, many times, again and again and again. We're really good at that. We're really good at greed, aversion, and delusion. What we've got to learn now is to get good at renunciation, goodwill, and compassion. even when it's really difficult. Because what's going to be more difficult than death? If you can't master these things in the relative difficulties of life, when the difficulties of death come, it's going to be really hard. So you've got your work cut out for you. And we all have our work cut out for, for us. We've got the opportunity to do this kind of work now, but make the most of it while you've got it.